Hello, welcome back. This is part two, um, and we're going to obviously do a preview on our away day on Saturday after international break against West Brom. And I feel really guilty, so um, I'm going to leave this bit out to Kai. Off you go, Kai. No, I'm looking forward to for, towards Saturday's game. Uh, it's going to be should be good. Um, tough team, obviously, but West Brom. I think Dara O'Shea's out now due to a knee injury he suffered uh, the other day against Portugal. I think it was. And they've just brought in Keen uh, Keen Bryan, uh, who's on a free transfer, and they've got a couple others out, Matt Clark. So they're quite um, they quite look quite vulnerable in the uh, centre centre back position. Um, so hopefully we can um, you know exploit that with you know some pace in behind with Benicophobia and, and Shea Ojo. Um, but yeah, looking forward to it. Um, I just wonder whether you know Ojo will get his first game of the season, uh, first start of the season, obviously after making after coming to us. Um, I just quite, I've, quite, I've been thinking recently about about Savile, and obviously he hasn't started the best this season. But I wonder with with us last time, he did really well in the two, uh, the four four two. Um, if Rowett does continue with the five three two, uh, would it be worth you know dropping Savile back into the midfield, back back into the two? With maybe uh, obviously I know that Leonard's Leonard's injured, isn't he? Um, but you know someone like Heathton Belder then pushing Ojo into the into the into the three, uh, the the higher one with with Jed Nafobi. What do you think of that, Rich? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, judging by what David Livermore said, he said that Ojo is best sort of playing on the the left and cutting in onto, his, on, onto that right-hand side. Um, I mean, I, I would think that he's got to try and... I mean, I think Ojo will probably will, will start. I'd be surprised if he doesn't, just because I think, you know, he's coming... He, he's obviously come with the fact that he's going to play games. He played them at Cardiff. Um, I think the other thing that might come into the play at West Brom is height in that team because, I mean, I've watched quite a bit of West Brom on Quest on their their show and, my God, are they direct. I mean, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, any throw-ins in their half are going to be launched in there yeah. and they're just going to keep asking aerial questions of your team time and time again, whoever that, whatever team that might be. So I think that's that's one of the problems that Millwall are going to have to combat and I would think that's surely going to be... I mean, someone like Matt Smith, he's going to be key, I would think, in that game. Probably, arguably, more for some of his defensive work because literally anything inside that Millwall half is coming into your box, um, yeah. which is interesting because I think... I was looking just, just before I came on, the most aerial duels won per game is Cardiff, 45.2 they average out at, Millwall 37.6 and West Brom 36. So the top three sides for aerial duels. Now, obviously, Millwall didn't deal massively well with um, set plays at Cardiff, did they? So they need no. to they need to properly be switched on for this one. Um, yeah, I think it's a, t- it's a it's a tough game, like you say, Kai. I mean, obviously, they're only behind Fulham in the table. And another stat I got for you: um, most shots per game they average seventeen point four in a game. That's more than Fulham, who did sixteen point four. So they create plenty of chances, which. Yeah. Uh, Maybe isn't what you want to hear before you head to the Hawthorns, but no, I mean I saw something earlier from Jed actually on uh, Talksport. I think it was he said that Millwall conceded six set plays all, all season last year, and we've already conceded five. I think it is in all competitions this oh, year. Okay. I think one of them came against Blackburn. Um, conceded a couple against Cardiff. So yeah, it's a bit, and West Brom have got the famous uh, towel, haven't they? When they when they, they do a, yeah, the a long down. throw, yeah, yeah. So they weren't impressed. The were, I think it was Peterborough, wasn't it? That that, uh, that Ferguson wasn't impressed with when they scored their 95th minute winner and he went running down the touchline celebrating with their fans. He didn't yeah. <laughs> he didn't take too well to that after the game. So um, hopefully it'll be a better outcome on Saturday. But it's a tough one. I mean, we did well uh, two years ago, wasn't it? We, we drew one all. Smith scored. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as you say, I reckon Smith could be a really a big threat for us on Saturday. I think as well, you know, Millwall tradition in the recent years, they've always played well against the sides that are fancy to do well, aren't they? I mean, even if you look at last season, the record against uh, uh, Norwich uh, in both games were good results. You know, there are good results against Watford, um, um, albeit not the one towards the end of that season they went up. But they've, they've, they've tended to equip themselves pretty well. So I, I don't necessarily see that as being a problem. I think defensively, the one thing that worries me a bit is not having Sean Hutchinson because I, having watched the team for the last few years, I think he's got to be up there as one of Millwall's best players in terms of consistency. Um, he's he's been superb, and I think he's been he's been such a such a good centre half. I think the fact he's been out it doesn't help Millwall 
You know, um, that's no reflection on the players that have come in. I just think it's just, I think any team would miss someone like Hutch and the way that he can play at the back, the way he can help organise, wins the ball in the air. He's so good in the air. I think yeah. that's 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 a shame for this one. Uh, yeah. Because I think we, should, we I think with West Brom, you know what you're going to get. Possession-wise, they're, they're very low. Millwall, Millwall are averaging more possession than, than, than West Brom this season. So, um, I think West Brom are like 20th or something for possession in the division. So, you know what you're going to get. They're just going to, they're going to come at you and they're going to, I mean, uh, Valerian Ishmael's team was very similar at Barnsley. The difference he's got now is he's got better players technically to probably get results. So um, yeah. I think it's it's a difficult one for Millwall. It's a bit of a free hit in some respects. I'm not saying that as in night like, they can go there and play terribly, but it's not necessarily a game that you would expect. And it, it, most teams in the division wouldn't go there and say, "Well, we expect to win this game," would they? That you no. you go there and hope they get they get a good result. Yeah, and, and any balls that come into the box have got quality, you know, with Alex Mal on the on the free kicks in the corners. It'd just be interesting to see. I wonder wonder whether obviously I know Ojo's come in and you know, and Rao does play that five three two. Does that may maybe suggest a system change or, or do would you expect to see maybe Ojo try to be a little bit converted into just behind the two strikers or play up top with a phobe with Jed in behind now? Yeah, I well I don't think I from I mean I've not been told this for sure, but I can't see any reason why the system's gonna change. No. Um, from the three centre backs, because I think it's it, you know particularly away from home. I think you know people will have their own thoughts on what should happen in home games. I think particularly for away games, the three you know the three at the back, the switch that Gary made to try and change the team's away form, uh, which had been a bit of a struggle before he came in. I think like that. I just don't see that changing. I don't see why Gary would change it, particularly against the team like West Brom, where you know you're going to be asked a lot of questions. I think you're going to want the height of Ballard, Cooper, uh, Murray Wallace. You know, you're going to want those people that can win those aerial balls. Um, so I think Ojo is going to have to fit somewhere else. I mean, Gary has said he can play right across the front line, as in like, you know, all three positions behind yeah. the striker. I guess you could play him up top. I mean, he did it with, he did it, he's done it with Mason and Jed, hasn't he? Because he's yeah. wanted that kind of pace. And the problem with Matt Smith is Gary, in Gary's, view I think has been at times that Matt's got many attributes that are really good but obviously he's not a player that can chase the back four backwards and forwards and shuttle run across and and do that side of it whereas someone like Bennett, Jed or Mason can do that so um, but in saying that I still think Matt Smith will play at the weekend for exactly the reasons I've said I think I think it's going to be an aerial test and you've got he's so good in the air I mean he wins a ridiculous amount of ball it's just you know He's, I think he's got to be in there. Yeah, and then as you said, like they've you know they've kept the twentieth uh, lowest possession, so they're not going to probably not going to be knocking it around the back four with no. you know as much as you know like Fulham and stuff. But the question is obviously with Marlon going to Pompey now, Billy Mitchell I guess keeps his place at right back while Danny's Danny's out. Um, you know I thought Billy did well against Blackpool. Yeah. Um, maybe didn't offer as much attacking threat as Danny would, but really quite good defensively. Uh, do, you, do you expect him to to keep his place in the right right back? Yeah, I would think so. I mean, I, I mean, I was at the as well as the Blackpool game. I thought, I mean, it's different, isn't it, when it's um, when it's a cup game. But I thought Billy, along with Murray Wallace, I thought they were t- probably the two best performers in that that game. Before that, I thought he was excellent in the wing back role. It's obviously different when you're playing against the top end Championship sides. But yeah, I think he'll, I think he'll definitely play. I think probably to be fair, if Ryan Leonard was fit, I think that Gary would be bringing him in to play that role for that kind of game just because physically and everything else and experience, I think you may be looking at that. But um, yeah, I definitely think that Billy Mitchell will, will, will stay in. I mean, obviously if Danny McNamara is fit, he starts, doesn't he? But um, I mean, Ryan Leonard has been another big miss, I think. I mean, yeah. he's um, he's been unfortunate with injuries this season, last season. Um, I just think he's a really good, honest pro, very good player, very versatile, like he showed when he played in the back, back three. Uh, when he played at centre back, I, I think yeah, again you, you're missing some players, and it's just it's difficult for Millwall because you haven't got you're not blessed with the squads that the depth that some of the other teams have got. No, and talking about former Millwall players, Kerry Kane's just scored an absolute worldie for England to put them one 0 up against Poland. Really, really good finish. But I was going to ask um, about Keith and Belden Evans um, with with Keith. Do you think that obviously you said that the area? I think you know Evans is probably a lot a lot taller than than Keith and Beld. 
mm. with on Saturday, does Keaton Bell give us a little bit more, you know, aggressiveness, or would you play Evans, who would probably give you a bit more height and a bit more, um, you know, ability to cope with the set pieces? Well, again, I would say, luckily, I'm not the manager, so um, it doesn't really matter probably what I think too much. But I think, I think, I think, I would probably go with Evans again for the height yeah. if it's if it's a straight choice between the two. I like I like um, Keaton Bell. I think he's 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 I think he's, you can see he's got that knowledge and where he's looking for where the ball needs to be played and the way he's talking to some of the other players. I think he's I think he's a really good sort of knowledgeable midfielder. I think in this one, height's going to be key. I personally just think. And, and athleticism. And that's the problem with a lot of the Premier League teams. Like when Gary talked about Fulham, if you look at how quickly they could counter you in the den, you know, they're just getting the ball and they've just got, they got, I mean, like Cabano shouldn't have even been playing in that match, but they had injuries. Cavalero probably wouldn't have played in that match if they didn't have injuries or suspensions. And yet you've got these two guys that the pace and power they had, they were just, they just made them too difficult to handle. And that's the problem. I think it probably isn't just a height thing because you're going to come up against a West Brom side that are going to be so rapid as well and, and getting onto things that you need that bit of pace in the side as well. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one, I think. So who would, who would be your starting eleven for Saturday then, Rich? Crikey, that's a good question. I need to have a look at the last match. Let me see if I can... Pick that up. Uh, Got it, Kai. Why, why, why are you trying to cop out and have a bit of time to think? <laughs> who's, who's your start at 11 for Saturday then, Kai? Uh, I'll go with, well, I think Gary Rowell will stay with a 5 3 2, only. So I'll go with Byron Goal, uh, Billy right back, um, Ballard, Cooper, Murray Wallace at three at the back, and then obviously Malone at left back. Um, the three in the middle, uh, purely for the reason of height as well. Um, uh, I go with Savile and Evans, um, you know, but key for Evans. Don't, I'm not too fussed which, whichever one plays. Um, and then I go Jed in behind Benicophobia and, and Shea Ojo. But on that point, I think if obviously I know it might be a bit too soon for him. I, I read somewhere earlier about Mason Bennett, but he could be quite key in the next couple of weeks with obviously the rotation of the four players up top. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at it now that I've got the team back up from the Blackpool game. If I'm looking at that team and I'm thinking who do I who do I bring in or out, it's a difficult one because I think that I, I, I think that he could potentially bring in Evans for Keefton Bell. I don't know how much you you gain or lose by that change. I don't necessarily think it's particularly a deal breaker which one of those two plays. Although as we said already, I think Evans is better in the air. The thing that the thing that's a question mark for me is I think perhaps looking at it, if Matt Smith plays, which I've said already, I think he will. I don't necessarily know if Ojo does make my team because I, I probably wouldn't change it too much beyond Evans maybe for Keaton Bowd. Um I, I don't, yeah. I mean, Ojo could potentially come in for Benick, but Benick's been playing well. I thought he was, you know, he's lively again against Blackpool. I think it'd be pretty unfair on him if he came out of the team. I think it, normally I would say that someone like Ojo would potentially come in maybe for Matt Smith and you'd play you know, you'd have uh, Benick up through the middle maybe and, you know, the, the sort of other players around him. So, yeah, I, I would say I might be only going one change and, and maybe actually Ojo may be on the bench, but yeah, I'm sure I'll be completely or, wrong. Or, or put Ojo on first and then swap him for Matt Smith, Yeah, you know, 60 minutes or so, because, I mean, I don't know how match fit he is. And obviously that's that's the key at the minute in it, is the match fitness, because I think that's why we're not seeing... The 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 Savile what we had before because I think yeah. he had COVID didn't he and he's I don't know how far behind um, on the training where he is because we don't know how badly COVID affects professional athletes either do we you know um, and how much their training schedule stops um, if you know if he's had to isolate for ten days or whatever and if he hasn't been doing the same amount of training because of being ill as the other guys it sort of puts him back two three four weeks behind yeah. the other guys, doesn't it? And he doesn't yeah. look he doesn't look fully fit on the pitch. He's blowing hard. He just doesn't look as if he's full match fitness yet. I know that I think Ryan Leonard last season well no, actually Jay Cooper actually obviously when you consider the amount of games he chained together mm -hmm. um obviously played on with the shoulder as well. Um and I think he had I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that he had COVID last season. 
and then couldn't train. And the fact that I think the other players were like, wow, this guy that's a machine that has churned out game after game after game, he's actually saying, I can't, although I'm back like, and I'm clear to be training, I don't feel right. I can't. So I think it goes to show that these guys, when they get it, um, it does obviously really massively affect them. And that's before you look at who's been vaccinated, who hasn't for various reasons, that's personal choice to players. Um, so obviously, if you, as well as if you haven't been vaccinated, the likelihood is probably it's going to hit you even harder. So um, I, I think I think it's a difficult one on that side. Um, I think for any of these players, I think you can only really judge signings. And I'm talking about George coming back as well. I think the only real fair thing to do is judge him at the end of a season or yeah, yeah. You know, by the following window, because. Yeah. Players for all uh, manner of reasons can take time to settle back in, can't they? You know. No, that's it. And we've we've said we've said all along. You know, we can't really be judging Millwall in four or five games. When we get the 12, 10, 12 games, then we can judge where we are. Um, but you know, being on the Gary out brigade and all that, four games in, I think it's a bit much. He has to change the formation he's playing at home um, because I think he's not going to get away with playing five at, at home for the rest of the season. I think he needs to change it up a bit. Um, Five away, definitely, but I think he needs to look at the formation at home because now you've got fans back, he's going to get it. I, I, I can see the fans jumping right on him this season, especially yeah. if we're just going for draws rather than wins every game. Yeah, I think that that's the thing, isn't it? I think the fans is another factor for every every club, every manager. Um, yeah, before it was quite sanit- it was sanitised, and um, you know you wouldn't get that sort of frustration if a team was building slowly from the back. I'm not saying this necessarily about Millwall, I'm just talking generally. Teams could play a different style and know that there wasn't going to be that sort of displeasure that would come down from supporters whereas that's something that's going to change that's, that's changed this season. So yeah. it felt like Blackpool was, a, you know, I thought Blackpool was a big game. I thought the players looked nervy, um, yeah. particularly. It was almost like they knew that if once, once they went down to 10 men, that if they didn't win it, they were going to be, you know, you know, they were going to get, they were going to get it, and I think, I think the players felt a pressure with that, and that's why again it was huge. Jed, I mean, how many times has he stepped up when he's needed to, and he puts that free kick in into the top corner? I think he was huge, keeping Jed. Um, I just don't think you people can talk about. Oh well, he's in the final year of his contract, and um, you know, if you get a good offer for him, but it would need to be, it would have to be very good money because how do you replace? How do you replace Jeb Wallace? I think was, his value under contract, Millwall wouldn't be able to get, probably wouldn't stretch to that cost of that player. I understand you might not be able to answer this or, or you might be able to, but we'll, we'll ask the question anyway as we're coming towards the end. I'll be cheeky. Were there, was there interest for Jed? Was there inquiries for Jed or do you not know? I think, I think there probably, I think there was. Um, I don't know. I think the thing that I would say with that is there's a difference between what would be a formal offer and what would be a club saying, how would this work with you if we went to this kind of level? So um, I'm not saying that there was like an official thing. Um, I think it's a similar scenario. I'm not saying Jed will go, by the way. I don't know. Yeah, Jed, yeah. Jed, Jed's his own man and I, I, I don't know for sure what he'll do. But it was a bit similar with Lee Gregory. The final year of his contract... Obviously, the club activated a 12-month extension. The way I'm led to understand it, there was interest uh, that summer. But the club, and I think rightfully so, felt that having Lee Gregory for the final nine, those that that last season, was worth more to them than what they viewed to be a figure that wasn't really that much in the grander scheme of things. And so it's that classic thing, uh, isn't it? How do you you value him? Like, if you sell Lee Gregory... I would have said before COVID, you might have been able to get looking at transfers and everything else. You would have probably been able to look at eight to ten million for Jed. Mm. But with COVID and where the money is and everything else now, you're probably looking at that figure as probably three to five million. And yeah. is three to five million what you're going to get for three to five million? I don't think you're going to get a lot, and you're definitely not going to get a player what we're replacing. No. Um, so. You know, Jed's taken a gamble. He wants Premiership and he wants the payday, doesn't he, for the last couple of years that he'll probably be playing. He's, what, 28 now, 29? Yeah, he's, well, yeah, as you say, it's a big it's a big option. It's a big stage of his career that he's coming into. Yeah. I mean, Jed's 
I think he did a did something with a podcast this week, another podcast, uh, not the top twenty um, podcast, and I think he said in that that he was just looking to. In terms of football, I think the problem for Jed as well, and I might be completely wrong with this, I think Jed, Jed, Jed just wants to, as you say, play Premier League football. I'm not sure the money is particularly the, no, the bill. Really. Obviously, it's nice to get it, I'm sure, and uh, football is a short career, but I think it's that feeling of being able to get there to the Premier League. And the thing with Jed is I think he's felt he's been at a Millwall team that's been close, like more yeah. than once, maybe just a player short or maybe two players short, but... Yeah. It's, it's so hard um, because football generally, each division you look at, it tends to work that the teams that spend the most money, they are the ones that are near the top. There's exceptions like Barnsley last season, obviously punched above their weight, but it's it's hard to do that consistently. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think, I, the Jed, I, I don't know with Jed, I mean, I, I guess he will probably just see how the season pans out. And then he'll, he'll obviously look at what options he's got and whether that be staying in Millwall. I mean, if he signs another deal in Millwall, you, you're obviously getting a very, Close very way. big chunk of the best best years of his career. Um, 100%. So, yeah. But yeah, I, I don't think I'd begrudge him if he went to a premiership. If he went to another League One, you know, like championship team, uh, not League One, championship team, then mm. I think I'd be a bit begrieved. But if he went to a premiership, I don't think I'd hold it against him. I think it'll be, you know, it'll be good to watch him at a at a prem and actually seeing his ability. So yeah, yeah, he's given up way. I mean, it, the one thing I'd say with Jed, and he says it himself, but he always he never looks to go into hiding in a game. No, you know, no. he cannot be playing well, or he can be playing very well. He'll always want the ball. He's not one of those guys that will just disappear. And so I, I think he's done. I think he's been a really, really good uh, Millwall player. And um, I mean, obviously, from a selfish viewpoint, he's a bloody good interview. So I'd like him to sign a new contract. For that alone. <laughs> no, but, um, just, just one question, Rich, and um, before we look to to tie up an end, um, John Daddy, not going anywhere in January, or do you think he'll be gone well, in January? Maybe, maybe, maybe. I'd say it depends. Is, is John Daddy making his own decision or is it like his agent who's advising him? I don't know is the honest answer. But I would say that it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me that he didn't maybe look to go in the summer. Um, it would not make a lot of sense to me if he just has a whole year of not really playing any football. Um, I, I think I think he'd be mad not to maybe look at something, depending if the clubs are still prepared to pay a decent portion of his salary. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, think thought, he, I mean, I, I, don't know. Know, I don't know if Iceland's out of World Cup or the, with the qualifying, how they're yeah. doing in there, but I would have thought that he'd be aiming to to get into international football. Yeah. And, you know, looking to get into, you know, obviously not League One, but looking to maybe get into a team where he can actually start playing football because I just don't think he fits into um, Gary's formation or, or or idea of a, you know, a starting eleven. No. He's had, he had a little spell, didn't he? I think it was, was it last season? Was it Bristol City where he scored? And he had two, he had a couple he, of games where he kind of thought, he, oh, maybe, did maybe he score or did that bounce off him? But yeah. yeah, true. But he played, I think that game is his, his distance that he covered. You know, it was mm. the club was saying afterwards how much he covered ground wise. And I thought maybe there was something that was going to happen for him, but then it just hasn't. Um, and I don't know. I think sometimes players worry about dropping, like if you drop to them. Uh, League One level and it doesn't work out for you, does that then diminish even more your options? But I suppose it comes down to how much you back your ability at times, doesn't it? If you think I can go to the League One and score 15, 20 goals, yeah. all of a sudden he's probably got a good move. Um, yeah. No, that's it. And it opens up the window where you've got a team bottom of the championship who, who needs someone who can potentially score and you sort of take a risk, isn't there? So it's an ongoing... Um, football is all about gambles, really, isn't it? It's... You know, at any time you're, you know, it can be over for you. So take what you can while you can, and and look forward. But if that's, um, we've had you for about an hour and twenty minutes. I, I, I really, really appreciate your time. Thanks to Kai, um, for setting up. We're definitely going to have to have you back, um, yeah, on, on a few more shows going forward, especially when Omar's back, because Omar will, will no doubt like to ask your opinion on a few, uh, different things. You know, positioning and stuff like that within within Millwall. Um, but yeah, you've been a great guest. Yeah, no uh, worries. Um, 
Uh, much appreciate. Look, if you've enjoyed the show, you know what to do. It's give us that five ratings, uh, five star rating. Doesn't really do anything major, makes us feel good, um, and it livens up our group chat between us. But what it does do is help with um, breaking iTunes algorithm and helps to get us further up the iTunes um, charts as such, or puts us in front of more people, really. Uh, don't forget the show goes out on YouTube. If you're not already on YouTube, then you can find us at that Millwall pod. We're also all the way across social media with the same uh, account name, and you can find us across TikTok, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Don't forget Richard is on Twitter. You can find him on, is it Rich Cowley? Or yeah, Rich, Rich Cowley SLP. Rich Cowley SLP. SLP. Yeah. There you go. You can find him. He's, a, he's definitely good fun to follow, especially around transfer day. Uh, and remember, he's got about 19,000 followers. The copy account has about two or three. So um, just make sure when you see that, that you'll see the difference and don't start following the wrong account. We'll be back again on Sunday night, stroke Monday morning. Uh, you've been listening to that Mill podcast. And thanks very much. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.